welcome to everyone to this uh, inauguration lecture for the IBM guest professor in 2012. Uh, we have, so before I uh, go further, I would like to invite the uh, president of the OLS Institute of Technology, Peter Williamson, to uh, say a few words. I will keep this very short, but the I'd like to take the opportunity to express, uh, express the, 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 <laughs> my word. the appreciation for having you here and staying for here as guest professor. Uh, this Tage Lander guest professorship have, have um, attracted quite a few very extremely <coughs> Uh, researchers. And we have been lucky at KPH to have a couple of them here previously. Uh, and I'm very glad that you can come and stay at Rodita, which is really both KPH and not KPH. This is an institute that is sort of run by KPH and uh, Stockholm University, but, but also in the Nordic context, but it is very closely connected to, to KPH as well. I'm very glad that you are here and you are most welcome to the H, Stockholm, and Stockholm University. Okay, um, let me, before I introduce the speaker properly, let me uh, just tell you a little bit. So we will have the talk by John Lauter, and then immediately following his talk, Sven Stastrand, the chairman of the Natural Science and Technology Research Council, um, will say a few words. And after that, uh, you were all invited to a reception here at, at the Manova. But uh, let me say a few words about today's speaker, uh, John Wes uh, He was educated in the, in the US. He got his undergraduate degrees in physics and mathematics from the University of Puget Sound. Uh, he then did his PhD uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle in 1991. He then held research positions and faculty positions at the University of Washington until in 2002 when he moved to Yale University, where he is since 2008 the Bateman Professor of physics, applied math, physics, and geophysics. And uh, that title tells you that he is a very versatile researcher, has a very broad spectrum of interest. His research ranges from physics to geophysics to applied mathematics. Uh, he has applications on length scales ranging from the atomic scale to the astronomical scale. And uh, I think today he's going to tell us about a very important set of questions that are on a scale in between those extremes. And I think um, John has uh, held many visiting appointments and, 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 and many honors, including a 2010 Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, and of course this year's uh, IBM and Professorship. Uh, he has been a visitor at Rodita before. We were very happy to host his sabbatical here in 2000. Very pleased to have you back with us this year. And I think I will uh, leave the stage to you. Thank you, Lars. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. Everyone hear me okay? Um, you know, I'll tell you about of Tori Aaron. I will be bit about a speculator a little on Tori Aaron. Hans idé av att börja den här post, tror jag, var, var att ta andra till Sveriges forskning och kultur. Men när man bor här för, för en lång stund, man ser och känner den bredare kultur genom språk och, och mat och och dåliga 
period here. So, um, after then, <laughs> for example, send me your book ahead. Jag tar uh, lite av Sverige uh, med mig till, uh, till uh, mina del av uh, världen. Och jag, jag tänkte att uh, kanske ta er uh, känner lite av den när jag börjar den, den här uh, post också. Så. Um, <coughs> the clock is ticking, but I do have to thank um, many people for this time here. In particular, I would like to, to thank Vitskap uh, Rodet uh, under the administration of uh, Sven Stockholm and his staff for uh, helping uh, their side of organizing it, his side of organizing it. Uh, Nordita, uh, with the director and the deputy director, uh, Lauros and Axel uh, Brandenburg, and the administrative staff at Nordita for all their their help in organizing uh, this and Albanova, and particularly Mats Larsson, uh, for uh, the, the, the environment here and helping uh, this transition to, for a long stay here. I also want to thank the astrophysics group for adopting me uh, for this time here, and my family near and far, and some of whom are here, Basically, for their patience and um, and generally good attitude for putting up with a very strange lifestyle that we as researchers live, and um, so uh, I can't really thank them enough. But I've said it uh, many times, and I will say it again. While I ask for forgiveness, uh, okay. Now. Um, Everyone here has been a student. Undergraduates generally are required to listen to the lecture, or at least feign staying awake. Graduate students are not required, but um, they often show some, some interest and um, stay awake sometimes, although they mostly know better. Colleagues come to your lectures either because they happen to be interested in what you're talking about or they come out of professional courtesy, or both don't answer which. Um, and family never have to come, ever. And, and so my family is a captive audience. And, and what I want to discuss today is really not uh, geared towards experts. This is generally a colloquium session, but this is even more broad given the audience. And so my my goal is to try to educate those who might be interested in how the methods generally that we use in statistical physics can be brought to bear on a problem which is, uh, I think, interesting and important. And so the, the, the target audience here is the ignorant and perhaps slightly interested. The experts in either climate or statistical physics, or both, um, you already are experts, so I can't teach you anything. Okay, so, so I pose this question, and I, and I would like to walk through this with what I just said in mind, and I will try to be uh, as least technical as I possibly can, and you will know when I hop over things, those of you who know, those of you who know, know, and those of you who don't, just view it as bad art. Okay. So to, to solve this problem or to address this problem of how to understand the, the climate, there are generally three approaches. One can make observations, which tends to be the rather more contemporary approach for reasons which I'll show you the history of. And there are two types of, of observations. There's low and high resolution, uh, such as it is. Low resolution, which is called paleoclimate, data going back, uh, say, 10 to 100 million years. And more recently, we have uh, um, more uh, contemporary sorts of observations, okay? Like astronomy, for the most part, except for testing uh, 
for example, chemical uh, analytical methods, this is an, a, really an observational science. And, and it, it poses a problem that we, we can only observe the past. So keep that in mind. There are these things that are called general circulation models, which I'll come to, that, that uh, basically are the engineering approach to take all the physics, put it together, and try to um, produce something that looks like the climate. And then there's this uh, third approach, which I have coined, uh, observationally informed theory, which because of computing power, you know, this is the traditional theoretical physics approach, it's uh, become out of favor more recently because it's easy to take things and put, it on a, put, it, put them on the computer, generally easy, um, although I say that with um, my tongue in my cheek, okay? And the claim is, and this is the take-home message. Uh, it's an invitation, really. The, the claim is that if you take a, a, a suitably focused perspective, there are areas of dynamical systems in the ergodic theory uh, that, uh, when combined with a statistical approach, can inform all three of these uh, methods and ways of looking at the system. Okay? And so that's the message uh, I would hope to invite people to uh, work on these problems. There's plenty of room. So, everyone knows this man Feynman, or many people do in the room. If you haven't heard of him, he's a uh, character and a famous physicist. And uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a very nice book by, by James Gleick, which I'm quoting from here, that basically says that Feynman viewed our inability to say something very precise about things as, as, in fact, the embodiment of science. And that's rather different than the way it's taught, for example, in high school, where you solve a problem, there's always an answer, it's an age-old problem, you always get the same solution. That's very different than research, and it really is very different than the way our science works in, in general. Um, so, this man worked on all sorts of problems, and he addressed this issue of uncertainty, really, and that's the theme here. So why do we struggle with uncertainty? Sounds like a psychological question, which it is, it very much is. And in particular, there are some types of uncertainty that are acceptable and others that are not. And we all know what they are, sort of, right? So, for example, something you see all the time, stock market versus pension. Okay. We're willing to, every day, listen to pundits tell us that the stock went up because of this and the stock went down because of this, but that you don't know what's going to really happen tomorrow unless you, unless you have insider trading secrets um, before initial public offering. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's so. However, we want a guaranteed pension, okay. and they're linked. Okay, so on some time scales, we're happy to abandon uh, certainty, uh, but we certainly don't want to abandon it on other time scales. Okay. Strange, isn't it? Uh, but it's true. Job security versus home mortgage. Uh, people switch jobs all the time, but they want to have a mortgage that goes for 30 years. Okay. So there's a short-term volatility and a long-term security, but we're willing to have one uh, in the face of the other. And of relevance here is weather versus climate. And that's really uh, qualitatively the same idea. Whether you're willing to, for example, plan your day using the weather forecast for tomorrow, two, maybe three, even four days down the line, but you're not going to plan your vacation in three months' time based on the weather report. Anyone? No one will raise their hand on that. You won't do that, but you, on the other hand, you know in the winter it's cold. Every year it's cold. You want to go skiing, it's better to do that in the winter in the northern hemisphere. Okay. You're willing to give up and recognize that on some time scales you just don't know the weather, but uh, one would like to know the climate for the environment that one's children will live in. Okay. Uh, so, living with uncertainty is easy, 
so long as it's your uncertainty and not my uncertainty. Okay. Um, right. So with that in mind, let's walk through a, a brief history of uh, physical climatology, which is, in fact, uh, having its origin in some of the characters that we know well and, and um, see in other contexts. Okay. It was Foyer, in fact, whom you know, all know, or many of you know, um, who speculated first that the atmosphere might warm the Earth, effectively a greenhouse gas, and he understood that the way the general climate system works is that visible radiation comes in through the atmosphere, is absorbed by the Earth, and then the Earth re-emits re that in what he called uh, dark heat, which was uh, the anticipation of infrared radiation. Okay? So, so we'll look at this in a little more detail, but in any case, visible light comes in, heats up the system, which re-radiates um, in the infrared. And so that's a while, uh, 1824, six years before he, he left the Earth. Tyndall put these ideas to the, to the test and measured uh, the absorption and emission of radiation from various gases and, 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 and put some ex laboratory basis to um, the idea of the greenhouse effect. And then there was this uh, man called Langley, who you mostly hear about in... Um, TV programs because that's the CIA base in Langley, named after this uh, interesting uh, person, who made the first IR observations of the moon with Frank Berry, amongst other things. And it was uh, Svan Theorinius, uh, a famous uh, Swedish physical chemist, who used that information to calculate the absorption, the IR absorption of CO2 in water, and then predicted, um, making an error, but it's still close to the present value, uh, that you would get a uh, five degree increase Celsius if you double CO2. And that's interestingly, the, the metric that people use, right? It's doubling CO2, what, what, what will happen in climate models, okay? So in this case, we can see that the origin of physical climatology comes from this uh, time-honored tradition of laboratory science and, and uh, combining that with observations. The first real uh, quantitative theorist in this area is Michael Budiko uh, from, um, from the former Soviet Union, and he did a number of things. I listed a few here, although it, it appears he doesn't seem so happy about them. Um, he, he basically put a mathematical foundation underneath these general concepts and then made predictions. Okay, so let's see what he did. Say something about albedo. Everyone know what albedo is? I don't know. Good. Okay, it's the reflectivity, the fraction of radiation that's reflected. Um, and so you can have spectral albedo. In the visible, you can see that Earth has got some white stuff and dark stuff, blue stuff, um, tan stuff, and the global albedo is 0.3. Okay, so that's 30% of the of the of the visible radiation is is reflected, and the moon is about one third of that. And since um, uh, material is made out of different materials made out of different things, they have, they have different albedos. So brightness, if you will. So that's an important ingredient in Budiko's thinking because he asked himself what would happen if you change the amount of white material, for example, on the face of the earth, if you change the area of the ice cover, what might happen to the system? Okay. So here, here is Budiko's model. Okay. And for those of you who, who forgot calculus, who may be in the room, um, this is just a balance equation. Uh, think of T as the balance in your bank account. And DT, DT is the change in the balance in your bank account. If, you, if there's a flux of money in that's larger than the flux of money out, then the money grows in your account, and otherwise it decreases. And if the flux in equals a flux out, nothing happens. Right, because this side's zero, that means nothing happens. So this is Budiko's model. Right? 
so now you have to say what's the flux of, in this case, radiation <coughs> in to the system and what's the flux out of the system? Will that change the temperature in the case of the Earth as a function of time? Okay, so that's going to depend on the albedo. So let's just develop these terms here uh, briefly. 1 minus albe the albedo is the amount of the solar constant S absorbed. And that can vary. This thing gamma is going to be related to where, for example, the Earth is in its orbit of the sun and its geometry. And then there's this uh, emission of radiation governed by the Stefan Boltzmann law, which is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. Okay. So then Rubico said, well, um, let's imagine what happens if we have several states in the system. There'd be a cold state, which has got a high albedo. Say, imagine there's a lot of ice on the surface of the Earth. And then there's a transition between this cold state and the warm state, um, which is given by a mixture of uh, high albedo material and low albedo material. So that's his model. Seems to make sense. And now I've plotted the fluxes here as a function of temperature. And this wiggly blue line is the outgoing radiation, and this red line is the uh, incoming radiation. Okay, now look, uh, there are several points, the black points and the orange points. So imagine I sit at the black point here, and I increase the temperature slightly. Okay, so I go to the right. Well, what happens is that the flux out is larger than the flux in <coughs> if I go to the right of this point. So that means uh, the system cools to come back to this point. By parity of reason, if I decrease the temperature a little bit, the flux out is less than the flux in. The system increases, your bank account goes back up, and uh, this point is regained. Okay. We call these uh, stable fixed points. Uh, fixed points, they don't change in time, and they're stable because if you uh, perturb them, then they go back to where they were, and they're regained. This point is different. <coughs> And if you perturb it, increase the temperature, the flux in is larger than the flux out, and it continues to warm. And we call that an unstable fixed point. And so the idea is, uh, what, where are we in our system? We don't quite know, but he speculated that if there was something that fluctuated, uh, the amount of incoming radiation, that could be due to changes in albedo, that could be due to changes in orbital forcing, then something interesting could happen, that you could uh, jump quickly um, uh, to an unstable uh, situation. Okay. So that could be either a global glaciation or a global melting. And there's evidence for both in the history of uh, the planet. And so you could imagine a runaway feedback in which you change the area of the ice cover, there's more uh, incoming radiation which is uh, reflected, i.e. not absorbed, it, more ice grows and uh, there's a feedback until the whole globe becomes an ice ball. Um, and then of course the other, the other thing can happen as well. And this is the ice albedo feedback. And Budiko is, is the one largely responsible for uh, studying this in uh, generally the format that I've just uh, described. That makes sense. It's just like your bank account. Uh, your bank account could become infinitely large uh, or dwindle to zero. It depends on whether the flux in is larger than the flux out. So what's missing from this model? Okay. Many, 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 many things. Uh, let's focus on one. Obviously, it's very simple, uh, but it's also quite interesting. So one of the things that's missing is that the way in which the heat is redistributed on a planet that has an atmosphere depends on the flow of the atmosphere. Right? Most of our weather is controlled by the flow, the evection of uh, air uh, over us. And um, here we see the, the fluid evolution of the atmosphere. You can see, you know, there's uh, regions of higher albedo, regions of lower albedo. You saw it on the still shot of the Earth. And when you heat in one place, 
then the dissipation of an excess is transported by the fluids on the earth. Okay, so let's focus on the so-called tapestry of uncertainty associated with this. Okay. So there are really two tapestries on, uh, there's, a, there's a whole tapestry of uncertainty, there's two aspects that I'm going to focus on. So the fluid mechanics of the uh, planetary atmosphere and ocean. Historically, again from particular contexts, uh, the uh, field of fluid mechanics was a bastion of certainty because you could do things in a very precise way, for example, in an engineering problem, and in s steam engines, in all sorts of technology, uh, for a long time before um, we could get to the point where, where we uh, could run into the uncertainty. Okay? So there is a huge mire of uncertainty in this field, and I'm not even going to mention turbulence, okay, which is the expertise of, of people here. Um, but let's just talk about an even simpler problem, which is indeed still relevant to the transport of uh, heat and, and mass around the Earth. And it starts really with um, Lewis Fry Richardson, who you may have heard of, a very, very interesting man. He was a Quaker, an ardent pacifist. Um, he uh, was responsible for uh, mathematical analysis of conflict. Uh, I don't know exactly the origin for, for, for why he was interested in that, uh, if it's related to his being a Quaker. Um, and he did foundational work on turbulence and had the idea that you could produce a prediction numerically of the weather. Okay, so that, that I'll uh, focus on. And this was his concept. In 1922, he imagined uh, some uh, director in the middle of a huge uh, concert theater with all these uh, spectators. It's easy, you just have to listen. These people had to work. Um, someone would calculate uh, something with a difference equation, hand the result to the person on the right, they would take that as input, calculate, and so forth. And this is the way in which he conceived numerical weather prediction. The great idea, um, and he put it to a test in, in 1922 by taking data from a single day in 1910, an eight hour day. And he calculated for six weeks I like to tell this to students who complain, oh, I did the calculation, it's, I, I think it's right. Six weeks, by hand, um, think about it. Um, during World War I, while driving an ambulance, <laughs> which couldn't have been fun, and it was a complete spin. Okay. But he started the, the uh, thinking, and it's really this, the concept in the previous slide, which is the basis of the way you think about numerical weather prediction uh, today, uh, except for it's done on a computer. Okay. Previous to this, um, a polymath named Poincaré was interested in the complexity of a gravitational three-body problem. And I just want to say that's the, an origin of um, uh, the work of Ed Lorenz. I don't want to dwell on Poincaré, we don't have time. Um, but taking clues from, bo from both Poincaré and from uh, Garrett Birkhoff, who was the master's thesis advisor of, of Lorenz, um, he wrote many papers, but he, f he wrote this very famous paper in 1963 called Deterministic Non-Periodic Flow. And the idea is uh, that he tried a very stripped down description of the flow of the atmosphere. So you can think about, if, if you uh, uh, think about the Bodico model, the, these dots are time uh, variations of x, y, and z, and then you can see the white right hand sides depend on y and x and so forth, and there are three parameters here. The important thing is that he discovered um, in his work what's called sensitive dependence to initial conditions, which is also given the word chaos. And let me just give you an example. I take these equations and I uh, solve them. And 
So imagine, so this, this, his idea was really to predict the weather. So this is a stripped down version of the weather. And, and, and he went for coffee and took the output, uh, and then uh, you put the, uh, the output back in and saw that things were, were going wildly uh, wrong. And uh, here's, here's an example. Uh, you see um, the initial conditions are the same, but start exactly the same except for this thing is a tenth of a percent different. Okay, so you could imagine this is the input to your weather model, um, and I'm plotting the solution x as a function of time, and you see at about seven and a half, you start to see blue and red. Okay, same equations, uh, a tiny change in the initial conditions. Okay, um, and this, uh, as uh, many many people here know, ha uh, led to an explosion in both mathematics. And in, in fact, what, what Lorentz was interested in is what does this do to our ability to predict an even more complex system than his set of equations? And so here's a beautiful picture, which, which you can make rather easily on the computer, of the, the um, evolution of these three variables. And these are some of the questions, which I won't dwell on, that people ask about them. Um, because they're interesting in them, they're, they're themselves. Lorenz uh, studied these, some of these questions, but he also asked, you know, what does this have to do with the, the original problem, uh, the practical problem of, of trying to predict, for example, the weather, um, not to mention the climate. And, and one way to do that is to imagine some variability in the initial conditions. So this is a, this is a, this, the same, uh, so set of solutions, a tractor in this space, uh, Lorentz equations, and you imagine if you start here with a little error uh, in your initial conditions, uh, that is, you start with a slightly different flow, what happens to that? You see, uh, if you start here, it's not so bad. Uh, if you start here, it gets uh, very quickly smeared out, and if you start here, it's hopeless. So this, this, uh, this whole area is, uh, is uh, quite interesting. Again, it's not the weather, it's, it's, a, um, it's not even the atmosphere. It's, it's a, uh, um, you say, a very general model of what could happen. Okay? Because the equations of the motion have similar nonlinearities in them, and that's the point. The similar nonlinearities give you this rich, rich behavior. And so it's a motif for what might happen. And I'll just say that uh, there's a lot of this uh, sort of work, this figures from Tim Palmer um, in Oxford, who's, who's applied this kind of idea to both weather and, and, um, and climate forecasting. But here's the climate. Okay, that, uh, it's not three equations. That's it. Um, look at all that stuff. And it's complicated easy to say. Uh, and what do people do? They try to build models which have all that richness in it. So this is a, a schematic diagram. Again, I hope it's not your bank account. Um, maybe it's the derivatives market. <laughs> um, so so there, the, you, one has to understand how this box interacts with this box and so forth. And so. Um, that's that's our uh, um, that's the real climate, if you will, and that's the climate modeling approach: is to put everything in and uh, try to predict um, what will happen. Okay. So now let me jump to the second part of the tapestry of, of uncertainty, um, and that is uh, statistical mechanics. Okay. When we think about statistical mechanics. As opposed to, I mean, even the idea Lorenz had is if I could write down a motif for the atmosphere, I could solve the equations of motion. They're deterministic equations of motion, but they have this nonlinearity, which makes things go wrong. But the idea in his mind was that you can predict the future. In statistical mechanics, in many ways, we abandon certainty in some settings in circumstances in return for having it guaranteed in others. Stock market versus pension. Okay. 
Right, so uh, I want to talk about Brownian motion a little bit, which is, a, which is, a, which is the motif for many things. And uh, here's a little ball sitting in a dish of small balls that are much smaller than it, little bronze beads, and it's vibrating. And during the vibration, uh, the, the, the large particle is displaced by the collisions with the small particles. And, and that's the idea of Brownian motion, which comes from Brown's uh, experiments on pollen. He was interested actually in, in the sex of plants, and he was uh, studying the pollen, and he saw it under the microscope that pollen particles were, were collided. It seemed to be collided by some, something small, like the water molecules. And here we can see it uh, from Eric Weeks' lab. Um, and, and it's an important demonstration, very visceral. This is, there are three experiments here. This has got water and half a, half a millimeter polystyrene particles in it. This is half water, half glycerin, 75%, 25% in all uh, glycerol. Okay, so this is very viscous, and this is less viscous. Okay. So imagine, you know, the, the particles in honey are going to be experiencing collisions but those ex collisions are going to be highly dissipated by uh, the viscosity of the surrounding fluid. Okay, and viscosity that you, you, you're, you're used to talking about or thinking about is you know, the feeling when you have a fluid between your fingers. Uh, honey feels different than water does. Okay, the ability to resist shear. We have a, an equation due to Langevin uh, for one of these particles. So this is Ma okay, in one dimension. And, and this is the velocity, the x dot is the velocity, and you see there's a minus sign. And so a particle of some radius r in a fluid of viscosity, eta, experiences a slowing down when it gets kicked because of the viscosity of the surrounding fluid. All the while it's being collided upon by a microscopic force associated with the water molecules, in this case, uh, colliding with the particle. The Langevin uh, this is, wrote this down about 100 years ago, um, and, and we've gotten slightly further. But the important thing for my uh, argument here is that you can calculate the solution to the displacement, the mean square displacement, is proportional to time. And if the fluid is more viscous or the particle is larger, it, uh, at a given time it moves a, a smaller distance. And Einstein's comparison principle gave you a coefficient there, okay? And you can say that's the end of the story. That's temperature, that's a constant, that's the size of the particle, that's the viscosity. And we see nothing having to do with the microscopics in the problem. But it turns out you can't understand uh, this equation um, with uh, the complete ignoring of this at all. In fact, it underlies, so you can see this expression down here, the viscosity itself, the correlations of the collisions of the microscopic entities. If you, if you miss that, you miss uh, everything. But you don't have to look at it on the time scale of the collisions. You ignore it. That's the, the daily stock market. You ignore that, but you, you realize that it's there. And it influences the long-term trajectory uh, of your particle. So interestingly, you can measure the displacement of a particle, right, uh, as a, uh, at a given time. That gives you an insight on the microscopic fluctuations in the system. Beautiful. So the question is, what's the noise in the weather? Is there, is there an analogy? And uh, this analogy, of course, has obviously been made. We've had 100 years to do it. Um, and so that brings me really to the last uh, uh, topic. Which I'll, it's something I work on in, in detail, and I'll go rather quickly through it. So, have you seen these pictures? Some people have because they've heard me talk about some of this. This is the looking down at the North Pole uh, with a satellite, and the colored stuff is the ice that floats in the Arctic, and uh, it's a thin veneer, about three meters on average, sitting over an ocean that's uh, 3,000. Uh, meters or so 4,000 meters deep and in the winter it grows uh, both vertically and in a horizontal extent and in the summer it, it uh, melts back 
and it's been doing this for about a million years as far as we can tell. But we've only been looking at it with high resolution since 1979. So this is the minimum, September is when it's at its minimum, of the first year of the satellite record. And this was in 2007, you can see there's a huge divot in the ice cover. And this is a, of, of interest and has um, been the, the focus of research lately, and of course mostly popular press. So, you know, is there a transition? And the transition people are interested in is, is, is if we come to a point where this ice disappears in the summertime, so that there's no ice in the summer and only ice in the winter when it's, when it's cold and dark again. And um, this particular observation is quite substantial uh, in terms of the total area change relative to the previous minimum, which was two years before that. Okay. So now let's just look, just to uh, see, there's 2007, that's September, and now I just dan dance through the years, 2008, 2009, 2010, and then last fall. Okay. So it did, it, people were predicting it to, to disappear in the summer, and it didn't disappear, it's fluctuating. Okay. So how do we how do we plan for whether or not the ice will go away? So briefly, if you, if you take the planet model perspective, this is the uh, 16 IPCC AO4 models, uh, shown as a percentage uh, relative to the observed record in the summertime, run out for 100 years. Some predict a very small change in the ice cover, some predict that it will vanish um, shortly. There's a large amount of uncertainty for that uh, prediction, and, and we could talk about that, but that's what it is. That's the figure. Okay. So our approach, because there's at least 16 times how many other people in the group do, doing the, the, these kind of calculations, is to try to uh, make a simplified model. Uh, again, it's a motif. It has the fact that the ice gets cold and warm. And, uh, the, and it changes phase, it couples uh, to the atmosphere by radiative transfer uh, and, and uh, transfer from lower latitudes. It is um, um, uh, driven by climatology. And the only important thing here is that instead of having uh, all those boxes and so forth, we sacrifice that complexity for a single uh, equation. And and this uh, could, of course, be criticized because it doesn't have all the complexity. Um, but in two things about it, it reproduces the seasonal cycle. This is thickness as a function of month. The ice grows, it decays, it grows, it decays. It gets cold and warm, as you might expect. It takes about 10 years to reach its uh, steady state value. And um, this uh, is consistent with observations. And the two things I want to point out are that from the mathematical standpoint, we think it's interesting because it's a non-autonomous non equation, which means that all these things over here depend on time. Um, and, and it has the feedback that was envisioned in a different way than, uh, than Budiko, but the idea of the ice albedo feedback is intrinsic to the approach. Okay. And, and this figure, I just want you to take away that there's a, there are transitions. You can view this here as greenhouse forcing. So as the greenhouse forcing increases, we go from a state uh, where you have ice all year round, that's the state that we're existing in now, that's the perennial ice state. And you see that there's a transition from that state to the uh, state where we have ice only in the winter but not in the summer. And there's nothing really untoward uh, that happens here until you further heat and then you lose the ice altogether and you come up here to where you have no ice in the Arctic. Okay. So from my standpoint, we, we, we like to argue a lot about the shape of this curve here versus the shape of this curve here, and that there's a hysteresis loop, and, and so forth. Okay. Uh, but the value of theorizing in such, way, such a way may be simply a qualitative uh, interpretation of how we might think about the transitions that are observed in the future. I already said that, there are uh, words associated with those points. Okay. So the final issue is noise. So, so is there a Brownian motion? Um, in the deterministic problem, which is the equation I just showed you, um, there's two states. You can think about the 
a ball sitting in one potential well, that might be the perennialized state, and then another stable state, right? You have to shake this to get, to get this particle up and over this hump, um, and then the unstable state is this one where you have ice only half year, half of the year. So you can imagine if this bowl, bowl, with this, uh, f uh, bowl with two minima and one maxima was shaking around, then the transition between these various states uh, would be different. And so this equation, which I've already written down, would have an, another term which is exactly like the Brownian noise problem, okay. or maybe not. So this is called stochastic, uh, uh, a stochastic differential equation because it has the fluctuations uh, built into it, just like the Langevin equation. Okay. And the first place to put the noise is the albedo. Here's a picture of the ice. You see that uh, on some lane scales and some times of the year there, there is uh, a lot of uh, dark stuff in the white stuff. And in the winter or in the spring, it's white. And the ice albedo feedback is the heart of the uh, uh, discussion here, and so one could think of all sorts of things, but the first thing we thought of is to uh, analyze that, and you can solve these problems numerically, and, and I wouldn't take the numbers too seriously um, at this stage. It's a motif, but what's qualitatively interesting is, is that as you increase the greenhouse forcing, which is what ha is happening in these panels, the red curve is the summer, and the blue curve is the, is the winter. As you increase the forcing, the system can jump over uh, for long periods of time into the ice-free state, that is, above zero. Okay. So this seems to be important, because if the ice goes away next summer, what does it mean? I have to say, I don't know. It means the ice went away, and it's a huge uh, change in the geography of the polar regions. But um, we also think in stochastic systems that there will be a dwell time in one state that is rather long, uh, depending on the, the, the circumstances. And so you see that the, the noise uh, adds a, a qualitative aspect to the, to the problem, which uh, is an important ingredient of its interpretation. Okay, two more slides. Um, being uh, in a position where we lack experiments, then one can only turn to observations. And so that's uh, what we also do. And we analyze day by day the satellite measurements of the system using something which has got a big acronym <coughs> associated with it. Um, it's multifractal time-weighted detrended fluctuation analysis. Say that three times fast. Um, and, and, and we produce this curve here. And uh, this curve is what's called the fluctuation function as a function of time, uh, the log of the time where the time is in days. And the only thing I want you to, to see is that this curve, the interpretation of this curve here which has a slope one half is a completely white noise process a completely random process. You, you, you can't tell what's going to happen from one uh, time to the next. And this is the data. You see the weather actually in the data. Uh, this is about 10 days. Um, and then up here, you see the slope of a half re-entering into the problem. So this, this time increment is about a year to two years. So the message to take home for this is that the system is, has a white noise response, or the observations exhibit white noise behavior exactly on the time scale of press releases. And you know, in the fall, there's a minimum, and then they ask you what's going to happen next year. And the data tell you can have, you can say nothing about what's going to happen next year. Unfortunately, um, it is unfortunate, but it is so. Okay. And then you see a change in the slope. Okay, there's a there's a there's, up here. You also see. Uh, a Brownian behavior, which has got a slightly different uh, dynamics. But the point is that the change in the slope tells you that the nature of the noise itself depends on the time scale that you're uh, assessing. That makes the equations I just showed you uh, questionable. Because we need a, a, they're tractable when we impose a white noise structure, because we have what's called the fluctuation dissipation theorem. But when we have noise on many, many time scales, uh, we have to think of a new way to address the problem. And that new way is naturally, uh, you know, approximation. Does that make sense? Okay. 
make sense? No. Anyone know what that is? A couple of people. So, so this is a field of number theory. Right, what does that have to do with anything? Um, number theory. So the Diophantine the approximation is the area of pure mathematics where one tries to approximate the real numbers by the rational numbers. Okay. Uh, real numbers by rational numbers. Uh, real, ra uh, you know, the real numbers include the rational and the irrational. The irrationals are really irrational, like uh, pi and square root of two and so forth. Okay. Um, well, these three gentlemen, Einsiedler, Katak, and, and Lindenstrauss, made a major advance on uh, an area of number theory uh, called the Littlewind conjecture, which I won't describe, but uh, this paper is uh, relatively recent, uh, 2006. And the important um, thing, you know, so what does this have to do with climate or anything? Um, what's the point? The point, uh, from my perspective, is that their methods here were not the traditional number theory methods that people have been developing since Littlewood in the early part of the uh, last century. Um, uh, so this is a book by one of the authors. Um, their approach is to think about what happens on the real line by analyzing uh, the evolution of things uh, dynamically on topological uh, objects. And they did, made a major advance in constraining this very old con conjecture by thinking about it from the dynamical systems perspective. And it's a really major uh, advance. And so, since all of the problems that we face here in, in climate are really at their heart, dynamical systems, one could perhaps ask whether hard results from number theory might be translated into trying to constrain a particular or general dynamical systems, um, and perhaps uh, with collaboration, and so we can understand books like that, but we, we can make some uh, headway going the other way. Now, uh, this is a huge area uh, to get into without starting very young, uh, but it's clear that there are possible uh, ideas that may eventually become a reality that are right now just uh, at the level of uh, speculation. Um, and as we go forward, um, I have to keep this in mind. I mean, you write down the Longevin equation, you can solve it, you can solve variants of it, uh, but, but uh, how much richness do you put in to reproduce the system? It's an age-old problem. Um, and how do you convince the people who run the very complicated climate models that there's some value in theorizing using the methods of, of uh, statistical uh, physics? Okay. So with that, I want to thank the, some of the people I work with on this, uh, Sahil. Uh, Agawal, uh, who was at IIT, is coming to Yale next year. Uh, Ian Eisenman, uh, this was part of his uh, PhD thesis at Harvard. Uh, we worked it out at Caltech when he was at Caltech and when I was here last time, and now he's gone to the UCSD. Wusak Moon, who may even be here if he's woke. Is he awake? Wus oh, he's awake. Uh, and the person who got me interested in this in the first place, who just passed away two months ago, uh, Norbert Untersteiner uh, in Seattle. And uh, my, my gracious thanks to uh, the Swedish Research Council uh, for support this, uh, during this uh, period. And uh, Nordita, uh, as I said in the beginning, and all of this work has a genesis uh, uh, elsewhere. And, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Coverage you showed 2007 and 2008. Yeah. How large are the fluctuations between summer and winter? Okay, so the magnitude of the change from summer and winter is about 8 million square kilometers. So there's that much change in the area from summer to winter. Uh, the decrease uh, for the last decade has been a few percent per year in the minimum. And people 
tend to measure the minimum. Um, I will also say that the, yeah, so they tend to measure the minimum. It's, it's seemingly a big, a big, a big target, and it's also consistent with the, the observations, which are passive satellite microwave data. So they enhance the contrast between the emissivity of ice and water. Um, but it's a few percent a year during the last decade. There's been this uh, more or less uh, decrease at the mean. Um, from my perspective, the richness is in the fluctuations. You said in the beginning that doubling the CO2 changes the temperature by 5 degrees. So this means you only have a logarithmic dependence of temperature on CO2. For how long, over which range can that be valid? And uh, if that law really is true, it must, must be difficult to convince people that CO2 is a serious problem. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you, unfortunately, you just put your finger on like the sore spot, the bleeding part of this whole discussion. So that's, uh, uh, the answer is people don't know. And the reason they don't necessarily know is that it's model dependent. And the models are of the complexity that you have that seen in the schematic, and there are many feedbacks, and there are multiple time scales. And so even in our little subsystem of the climate, the, the Arctic, we see there are multiple time scales. The, the carbon cycle has multiple time scales associated with it. And if you don't resolve certain time scales, your model will predict this versus that. And I think that but but your point, your general point is the heart of the, of, of the ongoing debate. I don't know the answer. Okay, one more question. Yeah, one more question is, how, how much can we believe the, the, the models that are presented and the predictions that are made and that are presented and are discussed everywhere? Okay. Um, <laughs> you're not recording, are you? <laughs> um, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, to be fair in the face of this, and so I went quickly to this. This, uh, the models run during the satellite era from 1979 until this time. They run uh, all separately trying to recapture the observations, and then they start and they run out for under the same ostensible radiation scenario. That, that's what this is. And, and so relative to the satellite era, this is what they predict. And as uh, you know from laboratory science, if you did many, many experiments and you got 100% error, then your predictability would be zero. OK. so. A lot of this is cultural, though, because each group, uh, they do model in the comparison projects, but the models are different. And we know this is uh, a dicey business. So what, for example, Tim Palmer and his group have done is to say, well, let's, let's try to do statistical mechanics with the, mo with the climate model. And well, let's look at the noise in the initial, in the initial condition and we'll look at the projected space of the prediction. Um, and we'll also look at stochastic fluctuations in the parameterizations in one model. But that's one model. And, and, and to, I think the models are much better elsewhere on the globe. And the reason is the, partly the mechanics of the ice, because this is ice that's sitting on the ocean. And uh, it's got different sizes. It's got different thicknesses, and so it's a, on some lane scales, it's not even differentiable. On other lane scales, it, it acts like a granular medium. And, and so that's a huge bug with mechanics. How do you homogenize the rheology onto, on the large scale? That's much of the difference. And the other is cheating mm -hmm. with the albedo, uh, which is another sensitive parameter. So there it is. I mean, models is one thing, but you also rely on data. I mean, you rely on, in order to calculate the radiation change,
constraints where you rely on absorption coefficients of the greenhouse molecules. So what would you say, what, what is the uh, typical errors in these absorption coefficients? Yeah. Okay, so, 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 let, let, so uh, um, let me try to put the metric on your question. So Mats asks about the error in the data. Um, so um, the decrease in the ice for the last decade what has been analyzed for in, in the volume, uh, which is a very difficult thing to do in the area, um, by Ron Kwok and Norbert Untersteiner. And what they tried to do was say, if this is the decrease, what's the, ener the, the, amount, the change in energy in the radiation balance that would be associated with it? It's one watt per square meter. So, so the typical radio fluxes are 100, 300 watts per square meter. And so I don't mean to be hopeless, uh, but it's one watt in you know, hundreds. And, um, and so it's a needle in a haystack, which to me is an opportunity for us to try to understand the qualitative physics uh, rather than to try to nail down every lid, so to speak. First of all, I'd like to firstly thank you all for a very stimulating lecture. It was really nice. Thank you. Uh, so now we will do the uh, installation of this year's Target Lander guest professor. Before we do that, I'll just give a short background to this uh, professorship. Uh, I must apologize because I prepared this in English. I didn't know that you are so fluent in Swedish. Uh, anyway, the Target Lander guest professorship it enables international eminent scientists in, the, in uh, mathematics natural and or engineering sciences to spend one year at the Swedish university or research institution. And it, this professorship was set up by the Swedish parliament in 1981 to honor uh, Tage Lander uh, on his 80th birthday. And I think as many of you, you know, of course, Tage Lander was a Swedish prime minister. Starting from 1946 all until 19. 69, so almost 24 years. And before that, he was also the Minister of Education and Research in Sweden. Tog Lander did his studies at Lund University, he studied social sciences. Uh, but he was also very interested in mathematics and physics, and I would say in, in natural sciences in general. And I think that's the reason why the parliament decided to focus this professorship on mathematics, natural, and, and engineering sciences. The Elander family is, is also represented uh, here today by Charles Elander, the grandson of Tage. So if you have more questions related to Tage Elander's life, uh, you can, I guess, uh, discuss that with Charles uh, afterwards. Uh, the Swedish Research Council has the uh, responsibility for appointing the uh, Tage Elander guest professor. And uh, normally when we uh, make calls, we, we direct the calls directly to the researchers. But in this case it's a bit different because at this time, for this case, we uh, invite the, the faculty deans and department heads to uh, nominate candidates. So that is what has been done in this, in this way. And the, actually the nomination of this year's uh, professor was done uh, last year. It was obviously in physics. We had a nomination going on right now. Uh, this year it's in, in bio and geoscience. So once, the nominate, once we have the nomination, we normally nominate a, a committee to evaluate the, the, the persons that are nominated. And the criteria or the evaluation is done on the basis, of course, on, on, the, on the scientific quality of the, of the nominees, but also on how well this person fits into the, the research that goes on at the, the host institution. So I think in this case, it's, it's, it's almost a perfect match. In that case. Uh, so once the, the ranking is done, then the, finally the research council makes a decision concerning the, the, uh, who should get the position. Uh, now you should know that over the 30 years since uh, this was started in 1981, 
We have had some uh, very, uh, we, the, the professorship has become very prestigious and, and uh, there are some very well known persons that, that hold this professorship. Uh, for instance, uh, Roland Hoffman, who, who, was re who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1981 and his professorship. He spent most of his time at uh, Chalmers or Gothenburg University. And also Paul Preutzen, who, who was a, a Nobel laureate in chemistry in 1985, has had this uh, guest professorship. So you know what we expect from you. <laughs> <laughs> so this year, uh, the Swedish Research Council is very happy to appoint Professor John Wettlaufer as a holder of the Targ Lander Guest Professorship 2012. And I don't need to give any further introduction to, to John. He has already been introduced and introduced himself so nicely. So we are then uh, very happy to, if you please step forward, we are very happy to give you some, first of all, some flowers. <laughs> and then uh, more long lived uh, proof that you have this professorship in the diploma. Uh, your name and signed by myself and, and the uh, chairman of the British Council. So, tack. Tack. So, uh, as I think Laurius already mentioned, there is uh, now a reception outside. Outside the room, rest. Okay. Everybody is welcome. <laughs>